First item on our agenda is to review and vote on meeting minutes for September 4th, 2019. I read over the meeting minutes. I didn't have any okay. comments to add. How about like John the, or Fred? Yeah, the one, I guess, maybe correction I'd like to make. The, the bottom of the first page, you say the board requested Eversource provide pictures and specs of the proposed equipment to be installed. Uh, I think I, I made that request, but that was for these platforms and capacitors and whatever else they were putting. Yeah, for the, for the big installation. For the big installation, not just for a single pole for this homeowner especially. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, did you have like a suggestion of um, like a phrase to add or sounds like you just want to amend it to clarify the meaning? Right. Just amend it. Uh, to include all those pieces rather than just pull. Just pull, right. For installations other than a single to be, pole. To be installed for installations other than just a pole. Or, or, or how about any installation? Something simple. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other uh, comments on the minutes? No. I'm make a motion with that change. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Um, review the past vendor payroll warrants. I was in last week to sign them and get the proposed. There, are there any comments on that? Okay. Um, do we have any uh, comments from the public on items not listed on the agenda? So, Chris, Dan, okay, I think Neil and Matt are not coming back to that part. Um, now, um, I understand the public hearing that we're going to have at 6.05 um, is being withdrawn, the petition is being withdrawn? Correct. Okay. I like meetings at like We're already on number five. Um, but uh, that's a scheduled appointment from someone who's not here in the room. So why don't we go past that, uh, go and come back to number five. Um, we've got uh, some old business. We want to appoint members to the Ad Hoc Center School Visioning Committee and discuss next steps. Um, now Brian sent us out a list of names, which I'm scrolling through to get to here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Open that up for discussion. I, I'm wondering the the skill set of the people that are listed, starting with Mary Stewart. What's the what's the rationale for their membership? These are people who volunteer. Yeah, we put an article in the scoop. Well, right, we didn't, we didn't but, ask for but again, we don't have a comparison of what skills are we looking for on this committee and who's filling those skills. We just have people. So and they're wonderful people. In your next page in your packet, which you and I put together a skill set. And I think most of these appeared in the I I, the I, I, I get that. Right. I, I totally get that. Yeah. But I don't know if any of these people have these skill sets. No. Well, it, I guess it comes down to us trying to decide if they do or not. I think or ask them, that's the other option. I think Mary works in Healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. Um, Marissa Hashizume um, lives in Northampton, and I believe she's in a graduate program. In what kind of graduate graduate program? I don't know. I don't. Um, I don't know at all. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Melissa Mike Sell, she says she had recently moved to Waitley. Uh, <coughs> Korbieski, I think he used to work at UMass. Um, Joyce, you know Stan. And Stan Scorrios is a biophysicist and all around good guy. Sensible, sensible person. And then I included a letter from David Swift that yeah, was sent out. Currently resides in Waitley. Uh, currently well, resides in Delaware. In Delaware sorry. Yeah. That was the part I was a little worried about. Um, 
him really be realistically being able to participate. Uh, although we do have electronic participation. Um, that's, uh, tough. Well, I, I know Rich Korpeski was involved in talking with him construction activities. I don't know, he's a mm -hmm. mason or bricklayer or something. The times I talked to him, so. Yeah. And what, what did you say his, he was doing now, his profession? Did we? Uh, no, I think. Very tired, right? Retired, okay, sure. but but the times I've talked to him, uh, and I, I guess the you know when we first started this a month ago or longer, I tried to match up people with the skill sets. Uh, we don't really have any uh, construction contractor contractors or modeling people on here other than, you know, the one that could have did both for the planning board would have been uh, Nicholas Jones is into remodeling and a contractor. Uh, I suggested him. And the other one for, uh, I'm going to call it, fine, not necessarily finance, but for a realtor was uh, Marcy Nickerson. Now, I, I haven't reached out to them, two people, to see if they're even interested. I think Nickerson is having a bad time right now, so I don't think I'd go there. Yeah. Her son just died. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and the other one, I, I don't know, Nicholas, Thank instead of Judy, I mean, if we want a contractor, well, I guess you can always add We've that. You've got to pay contractor rates. If you want a contractor. The other one, I... I Encouraged, I guess, to to, uh, to volunteer was was uh, J. D. Ross. But I guess he didn't respond. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would be uncomfortable with saying you have to have a skill that's on this particular list that you and John came up with, right? In order to be on this committee, in order to have meaningful input. I, I, and and it's, it's just, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I don't think you're necessarily saying that. No, I'm not. But I just want to be really clear no, but that we are looking for these skills, but we don't. It's not a prerequisite for this committee. No, not at all. But we, but, but without someone who understands market demand for these types of building use in a town that's two miles as the crow flies from now, you know, all, all the, oh. I, I think we're missing a, a very important skill set. I, I, I think. We're, we're in the same place as, as, as we were before at some level where we're throwing darts with one eye open and we don't know what it's, it's going to be it's going to be a gut check whether we want this building to be preserved or you know it's, it's similar to the letter that we got from from um, Swift, yeah. Mr. Swift yeah. mm -hmm. it's sort of I don't want this because and, and they're all valid arguments but they're from the heart and they're from from a historical perspective. Right. And then once the price tag is put on it, then people. Right. And no, been no, down I mean, that I mean, that with that at all. So I just, I'm, I'm very frustrated. Yeah. You know, well, but and can I just to clarify? I know I think I understand the skill set that Fred thinks is missing, which is basically someone who, who does uh, kind of construction, a general contractor who, who kind of understands the big picture of construction. Right. What can you say again? What was the skill set that you thought of as missing from that? From this group. I don't. I don't think anyone has a finger on the pulse of, of, of market viability. What's like the business owners? No. The like, real, real attorney, like what's what is more of a real estate development person? Okay. Now the the one that comes to mind that we uh, we've dealt with some properties in town and housing committee has looked at is the one in the realtor. I get. I don't know if he's a developer in South Deerfield. There, there's. Uh -huh. The one that's right there um, Man, on Main Man, Street next to it. Man Malik, or whatever his name is, Don. Yeah, is in, in the Main Street in South Deerfield. He's been <coughs> involved in some, town, some of town properties, selling some town properties before. I know that he was involved in the DeMaio property for quite a few years. You know, he may know that the, the area as far as uh, 
is what is uh, not only available, but what people look at or what the viability is of selling or, or, or the location, is that good or not? I think that's, I think that would be, that'd be a step in the right direction. I reached out to the, to the CDC and I, I got no answer back. I gotta believe the CDC would have those, uh, a skill like that, yeah. either under their umbrella or have access to a list. Okay, I, yeah. I can I can reach out to that to that realtor if you want for the for mm -hmm. our next next meeting and, and see what response I, I get uh, and even the uh, even J D or or uh, Nicholas I I don't know who else uh, into construction and and well Jim Jim Ross may have more time yeah. I mean, you know, certainly the construction world. Yeah. Well, then I guess I would. Well, um, I guess what action do we want to take? Can we um, appoint this committee with names that we have? I'm not saying necessarily all of them. And um, with the idea that we may increase uh, it with people who have some skills that we are uh, really looking for. That's what I was going to suggest, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, do, does anyone have any concerns about the names on this list? I did mention that David Swift, in fact, in his letter mentions a concern that he might really not be able to participate very well, you know, since he lives 40, 40 miles away. I, I would not feel, uh, I mean, I, I would think this committee needs to hear his input because of his historical ties to the town. But I, I don't feel like I feel compelled to put David's name up here. Um, I don't know the others very, as well. Um, I know Rich and Stan, I think, would both be good people on this committee. I don't think I know Mary and Marissa and Melissa well enough. But if someone's willing to stand up and volunteer. I think Mary's great. Mary's very think, thoughtful. I think that would be. I would not oppose anybody else, but maybe the person who lives 500 miles away is probably not a great pick. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, Mary's thoughtful. She's, she yeah. and she cares. She cares a lot. Um, again, I don't. I don't mind having Marissa on the the the, the list or on the committee. But again, I'm I'm looking for the skill set. Yeah, what, yeah. what does she bring to the table? And if she right brings now, something a, that yeah. I don't know, that's great. Yeah. So that's a question mark right now. Yeah. But uh, uh, enough enthusiasm to have made a phone call to Brian to volunteer or an email to Brian to volunteer is what we know now. Well, can we get back to her, ask her what, what's her background or experience? I, I don't think that should be a precondition. Okay. What's the interest? Why, why the interest? And yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be good to understand. In the email, said she used to go to Sunderland, she used to go for walks in the Waitley Center Historic District. Oh, okay. What was the clue? Uh, because the perspective of someone from somewhat outside of town, but close, who has an interest in our town center. So it sounds like oh. there's a perspective there, but not one of the ones that you already talked about. Right. I think, well, Mr. Swift has that perspective. Well, yeah. yeah. Or as well, no, I think he, he has the perspective of someone who grew up here. Well, yeah, and, and it's still that interest in the center right. town. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, I'd be interested in a motion on appointing the slate or appointing some subset of the slate. I, I guess I. I agree with most, except maybe the two that we have no's for on here. I don't see how they could contribute anymore. Even even Marissa, I, I, I guess I, I think you need to. I don't know, have some knowledge of the of the town, other than just driving through and seeing a oh, nice building. Walking through. Walking through and seeing a nice building. <laughs> Going out of her way to come here to do her walks. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, that's, that's, that's I, different from a drive-by. Right, and, okay. I, and I would actually argue that that skill set or that interest level might be interesting because I don't think that we should be looking at this strictly from the perspective of the the, and the, the, the footprint of Waitley. I mean, this is a 
if, if, if we don't start to think regionally about what exists, what doesn't exist, what is viable, what's not viable as a region as opposed to siloed towns, um, we're not moving forward. You know, what, what exists in the South County region or beyond include, I don't care what you include, but someone with that understanding isn't a, a bad thing because it might bring a mindset that we haven't thought about. So would somebody like from FERCOG help? We would have to pay them, I suspect. Well, I don't know. We'd have to pay them? Yeah, yeah I think so. Then I struggle with adopting this list at the exclusion of just one person. Yeah, and, and I would I would be okay with. It. I, I think the problem is not going to be uh, a problem of should we include or exclude them. I don't think he's going to be able to really participate, and that will take care of itself. Yeah. Okay. So I I would be fine if we just move the slate, and then uh, with the idea that we're going to look for those two skill sets and you right. two already came up with some list of right. names to to try and, and uh, recruit for this right. does that seem like a reasonable thing to do Fine. do i hear a motion yeah okay second okay uh all those in favor of uh, adopting this list for our initial committee appointees aye yeah aye but i want to get them going sooner rather than later i don't want to wait until yeah, but we, we don't. Yeah, we don't need to wait even until we have more appointees. Right. So next steps. Next steps. Um, I just call them all up and make them pick a chair. Oh, I, I prefer to call it a facilitator as opposed Facil to a chair. Okay, facilitator. Are we having a select board member on this, or are you going to attend? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to do it. I guess I'm. I am as well. I, I I think it's useful to hear comments and discussion firsthand rather than secondhand yeah. or third. Uh, I would personally try to come to meetings to listen for really? primarily, yeah. uh, but uh, I, I I sort of feel like Fred may be kind of better equipped with the history, but he's, he would also be there to listen. Really. Well, I don't I don't really care. I'm just Fred's on the building committee still, so that's fine. Yeah, that might okay, be the uh, best match, but I would probably try to come and listen as well. I probably would too. Official. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't promise to be quiet. <laughs> so maybe we should post these meetings. Should it be, if we have more than two, it would be a joint meeting then? No, it's just a posted meeting. You don't have to okay. Just a posted meeting, you don't have to okay. have an agenda or anything yeah. like that. Okay. Okay. All right, very good. So is Fred the official member? Yeah. No, it's not Fred be the official member. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. All right, well, let's jump back to scheduled appointments because I think we may have Mark Wamsley, all right, from the Kestrel Land Trust uh, to discuss the Waitley Center Woods Project. Excuse me, I'm going to pull up the assessor's maps because it's what we do. Sure, absolutely, and I have some chair that I can have here. Yeah, I know there's a bit of the assessor's map in the, uh, uh, the material that Brian sent sure. Oh, so you probably have all the material. Yeah, not in color, though. You know what? There you go. Thank <laughs> you. I think there are three maps here and three copies. I can also give them back. Okay. Yeah, we can I, I also just pulled up the narrative in the budget as well. Just oh, okay. Just to reference. There we go. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for yes, inviting me out to you, talk tonight. Um, all right. So it sounds like word of the project has filtered up, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm happy to answer any individual questions about it, but uh, I thought I might start with providing just a little bit of background, if that's okay. I think that would be great. Wonderful. Um, so Kestrel was approached by the landowner, uh, Chuck Dachi, uh, around, I think, two years ago now. Uh, and he was looking to conserve his property, 120 acres, uh, on Chestnut Plain Road. Um, we actually found out fairly quickly, uh, which we didn't know, surprisingly, that. Uh, Chuck was actually Kestrel Land Trust's first executive director back in 1970. <laughs> a bit of institutional history we didn't know. So that's kind of nice because we're coming up on our 50th anniversary next year. Um, so we walked the land. Um, it was absolutely beautiful in terms of its natural resource values. We also understood that 
Uh, it was used, you know, moderately for recreation in the neighborhood. It uh, has a pretty well-developed trail network. Uh, so we were impressed, uh, and Chuck was very open um, to the means to have it conserved. Uh, so we continued the conversation a bit more. Uh, uh, several neighbors approached us supporting the project right from the start as word started to spread. Um, we have kind of an inter our, uh, <laughs> the chair of Kestrel's board is actually Scott Jackson, the head of the CONCOM. Um, so although he recused himself of all decisions on the CONCOM, uh, he was able to advise us kind of informally about what you know he thought you know the town might be interested in and, and, and uh, just kind of give me some background there uh, so we in the end decided to submit a grant application to the state um, they have several conservation programs some of which have to be applied to directly for you know from the municipality uh, but it was decided pretty quickly that uh, Castro might be the best holder of the land uh, so we applied for that this past summer with the support of the Conservation Committee Commission. Uh, the grant that we applied for is called the Conservation Partnership Grant. The partnership aspect of that grant uh, involves that you have to have a public partner. The grant is available to land trusts, you know, private conservation groups, but you need to have a public partner. Usually that public partner is involved in holding the conservation restriction. Uh, there is a conservation restriction required through that grant program. Um, the, same name the, grant program again. the Conservation Partnership Grant through the uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental oh. Affairs, EEA, uh, at the state. Um, so, you know, we talked through a number of other options, you know, outright donation, there are tax credit programs for various land conservation, and we came as this is a nice middle ground. Uh, we had an appraisal on the property done, it came out at $260,000. Uh, the grant program that we apply to can give up, provide up to $85,000, but it must be matched one-to-one -one with local funds. Um, this is one of the reasons why the state grant programs, although wonderful, primarily work in towns with the Community Preservation Act, because there aren't usually local matching without CPA funds. Um, so uh, with the budget that you can see at the end there, the only thing, the budget pretty much has held true. The timeline has changed a bit in, in good ways, and I can mention that in a bit. Uh, but basically, you know, if everything goes forward, uh, Mr. Daugherty would be offering a $90,000 bargain sale on the property. Uh, so I should mention Kestrel's interest in this. Uh, we, for a long time, didn't own land in fee ourselves. We started out in Amherst in 1970, primarily helping municipalities conserve land, uh, providing technical assistance and the kind of the flexibility that we can, you know, as a small, as a medium-sized nonprofit now. Um, we have started to own our own land and manage our own conservation areas. Uh, we have a program we call, have, you know, basically the Neighborhood Conservation Area Project. One of the things that we've noticed uh, over the last maybe 10 years is that there are a lot of informal recreation areas in towns in the Pioneer Valley. Uh, trails that on a handshake agreement have been kept open for the public and communities have loved, become acquainted to for cross-country skiing, for hunting, for you know swimming holes, what have you. Uh, a lot of these lands are about to change hands. We're running into them more and more and either they're slated for development or it's just an unknown whether the future landowner is going to post them and say, I don't want the public on the land. So we saw resources and threat, recreational resources primarily. Uh, so we have set out in, in certain situations or when you know, the opportunities pop up to preserve certain lands that we will manage in fee as ours for basically public recreation and whatever natural resource values they have. Uh, the first we own part of Amethyst Brook and Amherst, which kind of fits that uh, category. We just opened another uh, conservation area a couple of years ago called the Greenberg Family uh, Forest in West Hampton, which also fits that area or fits that program. Basically, it was land in the center of town with trails that have been used. That one actually in Butts Hampshire Regional, uh, and the cross country team uses it. So, again, it wouldn't have ri risen to our, on our radar before in terms of its ecological value. It's very pretty, but it's a community resource, basically. What was the one in Amherst again? Uh, Amethyst Brook. We own a portion of that. It's a town conservation area. But when we looked at Mr. Dodge's property, um, and you can actually, I saw this right here. 
one of the first things that struck us, besides its beauty, and it does, the forest is really fantastic, um, is it's just really close. It's right here. It's really close to the historic town center. Um, and again, people that approached us, whenever we have that kind of community input and support, you know, it, it grabs our attention. Um, so well, we really want to see this protected. Um, so yeah, so I'm trying to figure out where to go from here. I, you know, so we submitted the grant in summer. Um, I can't make any official uh, announcements, but I can say that, surprise that this is early, I was invited to a grant award ceremony by the state in Salem on Friday. Read into that what you will, but I think it's a very good sign. Okay, unless they're very cruel people. <laughs> that would be really cruel, yes. Measurable um, moment. Here's yeah. what you missed. Here's what you get. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know that a press release will be going out on that day. Um, so I'm very excited that I, I think the state funds are <coughs> through for the project. So right now I'm just going to start kind of working through some other as back. You know, I, I'm kind of starting to figure out kind of what the town process is for the CPA funds. I know some of the general yeah. dates, but it's time to go and meet all the various commissions and boards and explain the project and garner support. Um, so that's where we are right now. Okay. And you said in these partnerships, you mentioned something about someone owns the. Um, conservation rights that would be the Kestrel Trust but on those or you said the, the municipal no, partners so, so Kestrel would actually for this grant we would own the land itself in, in, in fee simple which is the technical term um, but we are required to have an outside holder of the conservation restriction which is basically the development rights and right now the only uh, basically the only town commission in Massachusetts this has changed a little bit now AGCOMS can do it but conservation commissions can hold conservation restrictions oh, okay. it's the only town body that can so uh, we needed their support, just in theory, you know, in concept for the grant application, which they provided. Okay. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I can say like with one of the conversations that we're going to be having going forward uh, is kind of what's with the ultimate configuration of the property would be. Uh, there is an entrance right now with, uh, you know, kind of a woods logging road. Um, yeah. I think it would work perfectly fine. We know one of the abutters isn't thrilled with that location, so we, we did agree to look around and see, because we've had so many people right around that, you know, chunk of land express interest in conservation. Uh, Franklin Land Trust holds a conservation restriction on the property just to the south. I'm gonna be holding a meeting with them soon to see kind of what the public access is. I mean, the trail network is all linked through there. Um, could we formalize something? Could we ultimately add in another property with a, you know, a better parking area and expand the whole area and manage it kind of jointly between the two organizations? Um, there's a couple of possibilities, but they're, they're fun possibilities. So it's just kind of talking through and seeing the partnership. Where's the access good. road? The access road right now is right here. So it's on Chestnut Plain? It's on Chestnut Plain. It's just yeah. north of Claverack. Okay. Um, it, it's on the west side of the road. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. an opening of the woods right now. Um, the trail is, it, it, basically the problem with the trail, if there's any sort of problem, is the way it goes right now, it looks like it's going through the neighbor's property just in terms of the field. It, it's definitely on the Dachi property, yeah, this has that. but it has the physical feeling that you're walking through someone's yard, um, and it, I don't think it could really be moved over too much because of wetlands uh, just to the south of it. So again, it, it, it's something to work through, but it, it seems people seem very kind of friendly and uh, creative and constructive yeah. in working through these and, things. And so. what's the, the, how big is the footprint? Thank you, yeah, no, that was a great point I forgot to mention. It's 120 acres, so it's a sizable, it's a and sizable. How big, do you know how big the, the land trust portion uh, piece is to the south? So combined, I think it's slightly bigger. Um, that's my guess, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be around 300 acres, probably a little over. Um, and, and then you get, so, so that the Franklin piece is private; it's still privately owned. Franklin just holds the restriction on it. Yeah. But again, th there might be public access as part of the conservation restriction. I just need to see. And so, neither piece is particularly developable. I mean, it's a lot of rock ledge. Yeah. Um, I know less about the land to the south. Yeah. I know for the Dodge property that it did appraise as, it, it fits, it's a house lot. It's an estate lot, technically. 
it uh, most likely could be developed. The appraiser said that you know current market conditions didn't probably support it. My guess is because the driveway would have to be long. Um, and it'd have to be some wetland mitigation to get back there. But he said, it, you know, it has enough frontage. It has the size for one, for 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 one for really one nice house for one really nice house. Um, so I mean, yeah, the, it, the threat isn't of being developed. I mean, that is possible. The threat is of being closed off. Right. And the fact that it's just such a lovely property that's enjoyed by many people, it seems now, at, at its proximity to the historic town center, it, it just seemed like a. It so seemed perfect for our program, at least. I've got one other question. Sure. And I'm just sort of thinking five steps ahead. What would be, when you have a restriction like this, can you put, and, and you talk about all the trails, et cetera, can you put any cabin or anything on that piece for trail use? It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. The trick is uh, you would need to have that written as an allowed use in the conservation restriction. Original. Okay. You wouldn't be able to edit it down the road. You can technically amend, but it, it, it's not, it, it makes sense to, to think, you know, up front. Um, it varies as to how exact you have to be as to where it would be located. Um, as opposed to just saying, you know, this type of trail structure, or, uh, yeah, again, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, what's often like a trail hut type thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah lean to, yes. Or, or, even something, or even something that would be, and, and again, I'm really thinking outside the box. No, this is, this is actually, that's I'm, I'm thinking about a, 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 a facility that, you know, you could even house a place where you could rent cross country skis or rent snowshoes so that people can enjoy the trails. <clears throat> but a lot of the people don't enjoy these trails because they don't have those types of, those pieces of equipment. So that's what I'm, I'm sort of, I have, I have I'm blue sky. And I, have I have to look into power. I'm sure a foundation would be allowed. I have to look at utilities. Um, How about solar? Off grid solar. My, my guess is it would only probably be allowed on a structure. Uh, unless you carved a spot out, um, and probably would have to take it out of the project. You could put it on a structure. On a structure, yeah. Well, I'm thinking like 10 acres. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have to be carved out. That would be commercial scale. Right at the, right at the beginning, it would have to be carved out. Yeah, no, I get that, I get that. Yeah. And so it's pretty wooded too, though. Of course, it's, it's yeah. forest. Yeah, yeah. There's a pretty good elevation change there. It, it's really interesting, the topography, actually. It really goes from kind of the river bottom, flat topography, right up the side of the hill, as you can see in the topo map, which I handed out. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. That's one of the tricks of conservation restrictions. You really have to think into the future, because whatever you decide is going to be locked in. So thinking expansively and thinking creatively makes sense. Are um, those conservation restrictions already written? No, there is a template that the state put out, and then also that Kestrel has tweaked a little bit. But they are, they are a negotiation between the grantor, which would in this case would be Kestrel, and the grantee, which would be the ConCom. Um, there are some parameters, um, you know, for structures, uh, for mining, gravel pits, that kind of thing. They don't like to see, but a lot of other things are generally, you know, allowed and flexible. Like, are there? Are there any models, perhaps from some of the other places that you work with, Possibly. for conservation restrictions that would allow for a place to really kind of become, um, uh, I don't know, maybe this sounds too grand, but like a destination mm. for hikers, a destination for people out for a day trip um, to kind of bring people into town to do, like you were saying, snowshoeing, cross country skiing um, in. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a way that we don't, you know, obviously. It's the intensity of the structures. I'd have to look into that. We are in, in currently in a project right now with the town of East Hampton on Mount Tom. The grant we received for that from the state was called a park grant, and it really is looking for more intensive, you know, we are envisioning as a park, as a trailhead park to Mount Tom. We're envisioning, you know, kind of a, a pavilion and that type of thing, but that's kind of expected. This is much more passive, usually. So again, it could well be a destination, um, you know, a recreational destination, and particularly with the size. I mean, I can even picture trail races and things like that. You know, trail running races. Um, it's sizable, and the topographic change is really impressive. Um, 
I just think, you know, the structures would probably be minor. It probably would be have to be fairly limited to, you know, not necessarily primitive, but uh, you know, I, I think the utilities would be the, kind of the key. Would that be off grid, off -grid utilities? Most likely, most what about, likely. What about park? So parking is like parking is actually required through the grant. So that's why figuring out that access is going to be key. Uh, they don't require a lot of parking. Our standard lot for a passive populate or a passive recreation area is around six to eight cars with the kiosk uh, signage, trail map, that type of thing. That's probably what the state is expecting in this case. Um, but at the same time, I, I mean, as well, I mean, it, it is <coughs> so close to the town center. Um, it's a pretty quick bike ride down there. Uh, there could be some sort of partnership that way, potentially. Uh, that was, again, was one of the lures. I mean, this isn't out in West Whaley where someone really has to haul and find parking. It, it's really right there. What is it for access and parking for that? The other I don't know because again it, it is still privately owned that that, that parcel to the south um, I, I, I don't there's an old gravel road to the yes. old, old tobacco field so you have quite the access on, on the Franklin side is that on just that plane as well again? yeah it's pretty right. road uh, parcel now. three the one just south yeah so, yeah. so that's called the KCC line yeah so the KC family KC. I'm guessing yeah. is on that doesn't say how many acres, but it looks like it's actually probably a few more acres. Yeah, yeah. it's a hundred. I thought it was a hundred and sixty. Uh, yeah, that would that's probably in, in the right ballpark from just looking at the map. And I apologize, my my ability to read maps is atrocious. <laughs> Somebody needs to help me. Where would the Franklin Land Trust piece be in relation to Paul Florial's old? Just to the north. Yeah. Um, it abuts it. It abuts it. Somewhere down in these houses here. But his yeah. but his storage facility would be up. Oh, uh, up. He's he's the back in the woods. But it'd be back. So it may yeah, be the this. The one that says base state. It, uh, uh, yeah, base state blasting. Yeah, blasting. That's uh, this parcel here right below. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. We've heard that there were explosives somewhere in the area. I did not look at it. Well, I don't your attention. I don't think there's it's anything's there anymore. Okay. It's just, it's, it's no, just. No, it's still there. It is still there? Yeah. But they have a, I mean, it, it'll blast up the way it's built. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'm certainly open to any questions. Um, again, I, you know, I intend to probably go to the CPA committee next and start talking with them about the process and about what they think of, you know, funding levels that are possible. We'll have to, as the budget, as you can see, is constructed right now, um, we'd have to fundraise externally around $20,000 to make it work just to cover our costs. Um, I don't know how much flexibility is you know, and CPA funds, so I'll have that conversation with them. One of the great things about CPA funds is they are more flexible than a lot of the other grant funds. Yeah. Um, they can really make a project work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'm looking forward to having that conversation. You should have that conversation sooner, because I know there's scuttlebutt. Yes, on absolutely, on yeah. I intend to get on the next, you know, the next meeting that I can get on. That's probably so. I'll Timber October. Let me put you in touch with the, do you have the contact for the chair of the? I do, I'm not quite aligned, but if you I'll send it, it'll be wonderful, you. thank you very much. It'll be, it'll be good to start those conversations. Yeah, we, we were just trying to try to catch our breath at the end of the summer, it was pretty yeah. intense, and now it's. Because trails are of peculiar uh, interest right now to the CPA, so. I have a question, I have a yeah. question we have on, a question on the, 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 the Togo map here you show in the middle, uh, a solid area is that flat land or low land or it just uh, oh so are you doing an aerial photo out? yeah or it's not yeah I, I, I didn't include that on the key it was kind of a vestigial thing that I didn't see uh, when, when I looked at it on my computer that's actually one of the uh, conservation values values mapping units that we use when we look at a piece of land it's called caps the conservation assessment prioritization <laughs> system it's put out by UMass it looks at a metric called ecological integrity 
um, it's one of the things the state looks when grading out a conservation project. And there was a big chunk of it in the middle of this project. It means it's very high quality That's ecologically. A good, it's a good thing that that it's, blob it's, is there. It's not being clear cut. No, it is not. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, it was a quick. Uh, yeah, because this is what it looks like on Google Maps. I mean, it's, it's just oh no, it's good forest, and, and I have to. And, but that's that, that, that you cleared that up. I, I have to admit the the uh, person who came for the grant to take a walk on the property um, with Scott Jackson leading the tour said it was one of the best property visits he's ever had for a grant application. Uh, and Chuck's forestry operation I thought was wonderful. Um, he basically opened up some of the forest to allow some of the mature trees to, trees to grow. It's already uh, showing some old growth characteristics. There are some very large, very diverse trees on the property right now, and supposedly they have a lot of nice space in the canopy to grow. It's an impressive forest so right there's now. there's a forest management plan for this? There was. I mean, we would, as the new owners, we would come up with a new one. Oh, with a new one, okay. Yeah. And you know, you know, you're, you're, yeah. Well, okay, I was going to see oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Said, uh, I know you didn't share it with us, okay? Uh, do you guys have, do you have any more Fred? To, um, no. To sure. John? No. Okay. Uh, any members of the audience? I guess Neil, you have something and then I'll get the other. So, so I have the town hall schedule in front of me and the next CPC meeting is on October 9th. If that's convenient. Excellent. And the one after that is on November 13th. Excellent. So, among the uses not mentioned were snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, and hunting. Would any of these be allowed in the ways that the Kestrel Land Trust thinks about managing such a property? So you talked about hiking and cross-country sure. skiing yep. uh, and running uh, races, but those are... Mountain biking? Uh, well, yep. okay, so we had mountain yep. biking, yep. but the others, mountain biking, ATVs, um, uh, snowmobiles, are, are uh, beat on the land in a different way, and hunting, of course, would be unsafe for other users. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of question. It seems to me that we should understand what what kinds of uses we're talking about. Is it recreation only, and even in the recreation category, are there some kinds of recreation that would be viewed as too destructive? Excellent. So I, I can say from Kestrel's perspective, and I can also say kind of what, in terms of boilerplate, is allowed in the state CR template. Um, we approach hunting on a property by property basis. Um, we usually manage it to some extent, but where it, it, it's allowable, we, we allow it. Um, usually structures are the limiting factor, obviously, with the buffer around structures. Um, I mean, it's mostly deer hunting season anyway. Sometimes turkey you run into, I, I could see that allowed. But that would be in conversation with the town. Um, motorized vehicles are generally restricted other than for emergency and maintenance. Snowmobiles are one exception that are allowable often because they are seen as, basically it's the erosion uh, problem with other wheeled vehicles. <coughs> we don't have that with snowmobiles. Um, I do know a leg uh, of the trail, of snowmobile trail, of the network goes through the property. So we plan to reach out to the snowmobile community. Um, they're often just very good partners to work with. So we would like to obviously continue that trail uh, and work with them as partners. ATVs, general, like I said, other than emergency access, like the fire department need to get in there, are not allowed. Um, and it's not even just us saying that, that's the state, that's a grant requirement. Um, they just, you know, the erosion impacts are just too great with ATVs. But, um, so that's how I would. What about bicycles? Generally allowed. I mean, we have to write it into the conservation wheels, restrictions. That's why I asked, you know? Yeah, yeah, we have to write into the conservation restrictions. You'd want to plan the trails well and, and, and make sure they're kind of prepared for it in certain areas. Um, but yeah, it, as long as again it comes to, we have no problem with uh, with mountain bikes. You, the biggest problem we run into is bootleg trails with mountain bikes. You know, people picking their own trails and putting them through areas where they shouldn't be, not building them well. There's a great mountain biking community here too. They tend to be very savvy and very respectful. So um, that's something we, I mean, I, I would see us allowing that, but you know, we'd obviously want to do it in a smart way. Again, would take, would weigh the town's interests and concerns in any of those two where there is leeway. So two, fo two follow-up points. Uh, one, would you 
widen certain trails to allow emergency vehicle access. If you had an accident and you want, you want the fire department to, to get in there, uh, what other have to look than at that. getting to your parking area. Yeah, we, we would have to look at that, honestly. Um, we usually haven't had to do that. The big woods road there might be enough. The other property that we have that, that is solely ours, the one out in West Hampton, the Greenberg property, also has a big woods road. We have a chain across it just to prevent, you know, four-wheel trucks going back there, but we've given, you know, the police and, you know, the fire department a key to that chain uh, in town. Um, so yeah, we, have to, we, we, don't, we haven't had to usually do that before. It's not usually a requirement. Um, but it's certainly certainly that we think about and we take recommendations for. The other follow-up, just because I know the neighborhood is, uh, there are just a few owners between Haydenville Road and this property, and I know a number of those people use this property uh, for a recreation space, but they walk on each other's property. Uh, I wonder if there'd be value in exploring with whoever eventually owns the uh, Water District lot, uh, Scott Jackson's lot, uh, right. Becky Jones's lot, and Nicholas Jones's lot. Uh, those areas fill in what could be a corridor from a Haydenville Road access, and there is a road going to the wellhead of the Water District. And there is then a road that runs all the way uh, from the wellhead all the way to this land. And the question is whether that could be an access portal, and if so, then people parking in town center could readily uh, get there without going so far on Chestnut Plain Road. They could just scoot down uh, halfway down the hill on Haydenville Road and then turn in. Uh, but that depends on who owns and puts what restrictions on what the uh, uh, water district will eventually want to get rid of once the merger of the two water systems is completed. All those conversations are about to take off right about now. Okay. Uh, some of those have been suggested to us before. We just haven't had time to sit down with the landowners, but uh, we're very interested in having this. Yeah. So there's no access to that property from Haydenville Road? Not currently, no. It, it goes through private land. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Exactly. There is physical, but there is a road that goes all the way from Haydenville Road uh, to this property. Uh, a woods woods road about yeah. twelve feet wide. Right, but where, where are Haydenville? Is it you know? Um, right. Yeah. right in the water district. Right. That's right in the water district. It's, road. it's the water district access road. Next to Scott Jackson's house. So between Scott Jackson's house and whose property is above that? It's over here. Yeah. 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 yeah, if the parcel of five goes almost all the way through to this parcel nine, it would have to get across parcel twenty. It says here parcel five is owned by Daniel G. Dennehy Jr. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but it doesn't it doesn't cross the line. I have bought it. Right. It crosses the only one that he didn't mention is uh, Mitchell I Jr. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> that was very cool. Good access through parcel five. Yeah. yeah. Well, know anybody? Know the guy wants it? Used to be mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So it sounds like you're not asking anything of right, us so at this point, but you're keeping us apprised, and I wish you good luck. And you, I hope what you're hearing from our input is that we're thinking about like what we can do, for example, with our center school which is right there. Um, you know, if you're in the middle of a town that's got a lot of hiking trails, then you might make a different decision than if you don't. So this is really good for us. I'm really glad you came. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, this, in this particular type of project is really supposed to really help towns and help communities. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to what it could become. Okay. And now I'm thinking we need to extend the sidewalks. From, we might need to extend the, the sidewalks. Over to like whatever is the closest uh, access that we can figure in. Yeah. yeah, we're going to be redoing. We have a grant right now to redo the sidewalks in the center of town from from the center school cemetery up to the town hall, Hainville Road, and then we're hoping to get funds to do the yeah. southerly so section so um, down towards the church. Down towards the church, and if it makes sense, if this happens, maybe we would extend it or think about extending it further. That would be yeah. pedestrian access on. 
on Chestnut Plain Road to the. As we have con conversations about possibly expanding the project and thinking about it a slightly longer term, um, would someone from the select board like to be involved or at least notified, kind of, to, so they could possibly attend a meeting if they? I sit on the CPA. Okay. So. Well, I'm, I'm happy to keep anyone in the loop uh, yeah. and let me you know, make those meetings public. You know. I'll send you Jonathan. You can I send him your contact info as well? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, Spam. Just, Jonathan represents the Recreation Commission. Any rec, yeah. 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 On the, on Thanks, the, Neil. I appreciate it. On, on the CPC, so, yeah. so yeah. that would be good. All right. Chris, you got anything? Well, yeah. Sounds like a nice preservation to see the town. Center preserved. I mean, I've always had concerns about protecting the aquifer and oh, yeah. the trails. I've hiked those trails many times. They're oh, beautiful. Uh, it's a nice area, and I certainly don't want to see solar fields uh, in the historic district. <laughs> so it's nice to hear that you're preserving it. Uh, Chris, as the crow flies, you can be on this all the time. Yes, I can. <laughs> and you might get a new sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not so brilliant. So, <laughs> have any? Meetings been held with the abutters? Yeah. Well, I, I yeah not formal public meetings, just folks who are kind of inside the loop. Um, I met with Tom Litwin, um, who, who is, he's the abutter uh, right by the existing driveway. Um, Scott Jackson, obviously, as well as Margaret Christie, uh, who's on our lands committee. Yeah. And they've been kind of suggesting names. So again, it's, we're gonna start really running with it really quick to kind of get those you know, meetings going now. It's time, okay. uh, especially with you know potentially good news from the state. Well, we keep fingers and toes crossed. For you. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, okay. Andy, looks like you guys are done. Thank, uh, you, for done. thank you so thank much. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next step: discuss the renewal of the Waitley Historical Society's lease on the town hall, and an opinion letter from the Historical Commission on the topic of collection ownership. Which, uh, took a look at both of those. Uh, do you, how do you think we should proceed? Let me turn it over to Brian. Um, so background for a little bit of background information is that the, the lease that we entered into, that the town entered into with the historical society expired, um, well, will expire September 30th. We entered into a one year lease to try to give us time to get an idea of what the cost of operating the building um, will be excuse me included in in the packet is a is a listing of the last 12 months of um, electric usage and charges um, it's a little bit we don't quite have a 12 month picture because for September October November um, there was for whatever reason there there wasn't readings um, whether it was that Westfield Construction was still paying the electric bill because um, they hadn't fully really finished. Oh, okay. um, I'm not really sure uh, what that it answer better is. better be. Um, but I know that we paid $30 and we had electricity, so. Good deal. Um, right. That's good a very good deal. deal. Yeah. So, I guess um, Adelia was, was hoping that, that Judy or Donna could be here with her and uh, they weren't able to be there, so she asked if we would push off the, the actual sort of discussion with the Historical Society to our next meeting. But I was hoping would give us a, we a, could would talk. Would lease from in that <laughs> case? Or no, no, I guess. If, if the board could vote to just sort of allow them to stay there, okay. subject to the same subject terms to and conditions to be. Okay. Yeah. You know, you mean until, it's until we have a chance to talk about it? Yeah, but I think it. I think it Make would chat be, be good to have a chat to, yeah. to try to give me a direction in my conversations yeah. with them as to how we want to approach this. Yeah. Do you happen to remember? I I don't remember the fraction, but I remember at the time there was a just kind of a, a rough justification of the amount of rent uh, in terms of the expected uh, electricity cost and something like, well, they're occupying a quarter of the building, so. If they're paying a quarter of the electricity, that's like the heat and light and everything for that building, right? Because it's not got other things. But I don't remember if the fraction was a quarter, and I was trying looking at the things you sent us, like what percentage of the whole area it was, and I couldn't actually figure it out. And I knew there were people who would know more and possibly yeah. remember more than me. 
because it was like about minutes. That was based on, I think, square footage. I think so. Uh, yeah. yeah. There were 25 percent of the total. Uh, the total square footage outside of the hallways and things like that. So no, hallways uh, wouldn't be necessarily uh, I that. don't know if they included hallways or not. I think it was total floor area, including hallways and and upstairs, stairways and whatever. And, and upstairs. upstairs, yeah, yeah upstairs, so yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, they're roughly half of the first floor, which is. Right. Yeah. So that, that kind of makes. Right. So, yeah. 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 So that, that makes. Uh, and I think we we estimated some utility costs. That, of course, we didn't know because for the history of it, because it wasn't wasn't uh, used for several years. So we took a guess at it. Right. Come off with the twenty five percent of the yeah. of the total, which you know maybe that's the thing we need to look at again. Right. Well, I did a little calculation. I know you'll find it strange that I would pull out an Excel spreadsheet, crunch some numbers. But I took the 10 months that we do have, and granted, uh, I think the two months that are missing are the actual months of September and October, which are pretty mild. They don't normally, they're probably not uh, huge months in terms of electricity consumption. Um, if we look, but if we look at those 10 months, because that's the ones we got, um, we, uh, if we take the, Average month is seven hundred and thirty-three dollars and sixty-two cents right. for electric okay. bill. If we divide that by four, we get one hundred and eighty-three dollars uh, um, per month uh, for one quarter of the electric bill. What the sixteen hundred dollars rent actually comes to is one hundred and thirty-three dollars a month. So there's something like a fifty dollars a month difference between that. Ar I mean, maybe the quarter was an arbitrary target, but but I, I just point out there's that difference. We were making estimates. We knew we yeah, didn't have right. complete information. Our estimates weren't that bad. They were um, hitting basically a sixth of the electric bill with the rent payments. Uh, do we want to adjust that or do we want to stick with the one sixth, which is roughly what we have now uh, in rent? I just, I'm not putting that out there with any agenda. I'm just saying that's what the numbers say given what the information we have right now. It, that number could be adjusted a little bit, probably downward, because I think the missing bills would have been smaller. They would have been more in the area of, let's see, if September is anything to go by uh, of last year, you know, that was a few hundred dollars and not, uh, um, that was like $300, right? Yep. Um, so I wouldn't imagine that. So we put a 300 and a 400 in there to get a full year. <coughs> To get a full year? So you're adding 700 to your total. Divide that by 12. I can, uh, I can do that right now. Well, and I honestly choked on those numbers. I, I, I find them, for the amount of usage the building gets, extraordinarily high. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, I don't, I, yeah, go ahead, Neil. I, so what do you think the use is? I, I wouldn't pretend to guess. Just it's 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 an eyeball of it. So, so the months of September, this this month, twenty one different meetings. So is that twenty one days that we use? Would you say? Well, twenty one different bookings of either the auditorium or the uh, the meeting room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's the highest it's been. It's been rising steadily. It was low in the summer, uh, about ten and September is 21, and it looks to me like um, the rest of the fall will be that or higher. Bookings are still coming in. So, so my point is that that's not occasional. That's, uh, well, that's multiple times, uh, divided by four, <coughs> that's five different meetings a week that are being held there. Some of them are town boards and commissions. Uh, some of them are other community groups. So use so that point is use uh, think about that number, which is whatever it is, but it, it's it's that and it's growing. Yeah. So far. So the, the other point I'll make is that we didn't get training on how to properly manage the HVAC system until May. So we didn't have that training during the winter. Uh, we we had had a partial training. We did what we were told. Uh, we can do greater setbacks and manage 
to reduce the energy costs in the winter um, by lowering the temperature when it's not occupied. Like the big peak, what yeah. is it, $3,500 or so, yeah. came in the three coldest months. Yeah. Uh, and so if we could turn that back 30% or 40%, um, okay. we now know how to do it. And I've already set the setbacks and the ambient temperatures when the building's not occupied um, to reduce energy conservation. We did one part of that in May. That may have contributed to the lower rates we've had since May. And when I got these numbers uh, just in the last week or so, uh, I went up and pushed the setbacks and the ambient temperatures further uh, to reduce uh, usage. Uh, so this probably is significantly higher. How much higher? I don't know. Uh -huh. 25 or 30 percent higher than what will okay. come out with the adjustments that I've made in the system. Um, yeah. And we were talking about the, the difference is only 30 percent. Right. right. So, but, it, but when when you figured in those two low months, the 300 and the 400. Well, yeah, I can tell you what it, when I, I put 400 in for two for, for two, two months, months that are missing, um, that brought. Um, <coughs> The average bill down uh, below 700, 678 a month, uh, average over the year. Um, a quarter of that would be $169 a month compared to 133 with their bank. So it's a difference closer to 35 bucks. No, I, I would, I would su a, suggest we, we keep the same amount we have in here now yeah. because, as Neil's saying, we're gonna, it's going to be changing or improving. Let's it. get another year's worth of data. Yeah, another year rather than guessing at another number that's. Not any better than yeah. what we have maybe today. Yeah. I, I would suggest we yeah. we keep the same number. If they're agreeable with that, I, I guess yeah. we need to hear their side of the story. And, right. The know, difference no. is not large enough to yeah for, for me to feel like it has to go, do something at this yeah. point. Uh, and and that's a separate issue. And I, I guess Neil, all due respect, I still think that the, that the numbers are high because your your usage, it's it's what's the average hourly usage for each of those instances. I mean, it's not like they're eight hour uses. If, if, the, if the building's being used five times in a week, and 10 times, you know, even even 10 times in a, in a week. It's my, probably, probably 10 or 12 hours. Yeah. Total, yeah. right. So that's, it seems like a lot. Right, which is why I, I can push the empty building <coughs> settings to use less energy, which is what I've done. Right. Right, and, and I'm not. And, and that hasn't been, hadn't been done yet, so we don't know what have, right. what effect that'll have. So I'm just saying that these numbers are going to be high, regardless, higher than right, higher than the next year. Right. Um, yeah. The other thing that, and, I, and you know, and I, and I'm looking at the same. Right. the email, and maybe we do need to wait for 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 someone like like Donna or or D, but I, I am curious as to what the legal bounds are for a town to I don't want to use the word subsume but to oversee control facilitate I don't know what the word would be a 501c3 um, as you guys know I've consistently been concerned about the precedent of and, and what happens if if the historical society doesn't have the, <clears throat> the participation it, it currently does? I think there are a lot of issues that we need to, to think about, and I and I continue to be at least interested in more facts around how the commission could serve as an umbrella, not just for the properties of the society, but for the society in and of itself. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, Jonathan, and and, and I think they, they need to provide us with some more information. i like to see more information on, you know, they did a survey of the towns that have historic societies in town buildings. Uh, that's a start. I guess uh, I would suggest that they give us information on, are they paying rent to, the, to these towns? 
for their space and what is roughly the square footage of that space so we have some idea are we in a ballpark for that and then an, another item is uh, does the town budgets provide money to these historic societies every year is it in the town budget to give them a, an amount every year we don't know well we don't uh, right no we, we don't but uh, I, I think that that may be something coming eventually because we need to decide as as uh, administrators of the, of the town that we want to preserve history in town and it's going to cost money to do that you just can't do it by fundraising and if historic society is having issues with financing and fundraising and maintaining stuff then it may be time for the town to step in and look at it and see what can the town contribute and maybe at that point decide uh, who is actually going to be involved in doing that whether it goes through a historic commission or just directly to historic society I, I think if, if there's financial problems coming down the road which I kind of hear there may be the town needs to step up and support this kind of activity in town well and it's why I think that it's just cleaner if it's an arm a, 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 a oh, loose arm I don't, I don't know what the what what the technical definition would be yeah because the historical society is incredibly important. we already discussed it so we don't want to we don't want to beat this thing to death right but it just seems if it's if it's allowed and, and brian i think you're probably the best person to figure out what's possible and what's not and then at least we know the parameters of what's possible that we should look at whether the commission should be the Lord Protectorate of the society because it, it's just if town funds are going to be used and I have no problem with that at all then or at least the potential for those funds to be used in, in, in times of of, of, of of consequence to the society it, it's just we then we have a, a system a mechanism in place rather than just we think this is a good idea right now let's let's step in I well, is it, is it going to come down to whether the town can give money to the society or if it has to be the historic commission? I, I, I think, think it's we're, clear we're kind of wandering here a little bit off yeah. of the, the topic. Um, I, it makes, from listening to you, I would think there is there are rumors of an impending financial bankruptcy at the historic society. I, I have not that. heard anything like that. No, we're talking about the town having to step in and take over. And, and, I, and I just, I don't think they're asking for money. They're asking for a lease on the property. I didn't say right? that. Though. I, I understand. I understand. But I'm just, I'm listening to what you're saying, and that's that's where my mind is going. So we're not talking about the historical society is on the brink of collapse. Okay. Just want to make that really clear for the FCAT audience. We're not suggesting that at all. Okay. That I that's what I that's what I was hearing when like the town having to step in if the historical society can't do this that or the other thing. But I mean they're they're doing a good job at what they do. Okay at this point okay i just want to make it clear because and that's i didn't what I was say yeah. anything to the contrary okay good good i want to just but, make it really clear but planning is actually a good thing and being strategic and the historical society is a separate entity uh -huh. and i think it's neater if the commission has some some defined oversight so that we as a town remain clean and strategic about who's in our buildings. It doesn't mean that the society, that the society is not doing a good job. It's doing an incredible job, and I said that. But the commission's the town entity. Uh -huh. And if there's some relationship that can be created to make that a cleaner partnership, then were we missed not to look into it? So. Okay. So could we have a motion related to the matter on the agenda, which would be the historic society's lease? But maybe I saw a hand up earlier and I ignored it. But so, so Neil. So my points are not about the lease. If you want to vote on that, but the two points <laughs> about the broader issue that you've been discussing. Okay. Shall Let's I? take care of the lease first, okay. and then we can. Uh, probably afford a little bit of time but we've got other things on the agenda as well really so we'll make it really brief um, uh, regarding the lease do I make a motion we uh, 
extend the lease for another year at the same uh, rent figure that we have in here today. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Okay. Very briefly. Neil, so can two you very brief points those? in anticipation of the broader discussion you'll have when you get the full roster of folks. Um, they have researched with the State Historical Commission proper roles of a Community Historical Commission and that seemed pretty confining. So some work beyond what they've been able to do, if developing whatever might be a partnership or relationship, uh, but tasking a town historical commission with oversight or ownership or whatever of uh, a museum collection seems not to be within what the state advises. I don't know whether it's allowed, but at least it's not what's advised. The other problem is uh, that you should know about is that at, uh, I think it's Hatfield, where the uh, collection of artifacts is owned by the town. Then it becomes public property and acquisition and deaccession follow all the rules of public property, including having to vote to acquire, you're a pot, they're a potholder, uh, and requiring a vote, maybe even a, an auction process or a bidding process to get rid of it. <coughs> and so having an independent 501c3 with good principles that can set acquisition and deaccession policies, as long as they don't abuse them, uh, is a whole lot better than having public property uh, regulations. Oh, we could have town meeting for three days. And you could, vo could. voting we item by item them. on this dress and that glove right. uh, because they're all town property. So, yeah. careful what you wish for. Uh, and Hatfield is apparently. They're uh, really happy with this, you're saying? Cause they're, they're not happy with what they got themselves into without having thought about uh, yeah. going to ownership. More to come at okay. your next meeting on this. All right. Okay. Maybe we should close this discussion and go on to the new business. Uh, first item under new business is discuss and vote to award the contract for the fire station siding project. My understanding is uh, JDR Builders was the Correct. low bid, and it, it's is it within the money we budgeted? Do we have any budgeting troubles? Um, nope. Okay. We have like. 31,500, I think it's within okay. the budget. Not by much. Okay, yeah, it's close, but uh, uh, does anybody have any other comments to add? No. Nope. We'll make a motion. We uh, approve the uh, JDR builders as the lowest bid for the siding of the Whaley Fire Station. I'll second that. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Um, Next is the uh, memorandum of understanding with the Franklin County Solid Waste District for third party inspection of the transfer station. This is pretty. Um, exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. It's the thing we do every year. Third party, MassDP requires a third party to inspect transfer stations. Okay, and this we don't have to vote on, right? We're just signing it? Uh, or we could vote you can, on it. You can do both, sure. I would make a motion that we sign this memorandum of understanding so we can get comply with the law and have a third party inspection of our transfer station. That was a second. All in favor? Yep. Aye. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, third item to discuss and vote to reappoint a select board member to the Frontier Regional School Capital District Capital Planning Committee. Is there any other insights you want to put on that, Brian? Or this is this 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 is the committee that um, that was on last fiscal year for the planning for the capital improvements frontier, yeah. um, and now they're going to be moving into implementation. Um, so they want to keep the committee uh, together. So okay. uh, Darius sent a request that. Uh, Town appoint a, or reappoint a select board member to, to continue the work. Now, Fred, are you still willing to serve sure. on that? Yes. Then I'd nominate Fred to continue 
continuity sounds like it'd be a good idea there. Okay. Then I think, well, I guess we're trying to be official. All in favor? All right. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Brad. So um, we the next item is just reviewing a draft ADA self-evaluation and transition plan, and I have not even looked at it yet. So I'm relying heavily on Brian's description and. Well, I won't mull it over, looking it over while we. Yeah, I don't think we. Well, let me talk a little bit about the timeline now that we're on. Um, the self-evaluation and transition plan is a requirement of the grant application that we're submitting for the library to install the, the limited use, limited activity lift to provide accessibility to the lower floors along with renovating the bathrooms and, and some other modifications to make the building compliant. So that's due October 8th. Um, so both of these, so this evaluation plan and transition plan needs to be wrapped up prior to that date. Um, I, I don't like to submit things on the date that they're due because right. bad things happen when that happens. Um, so this gives us about a week and a half of about. Um, so I actually just wrapped up this draft this afternoon. So really nobody except me and the people who get the evaluation okay. to have looked at it. Um, so I think it might be useful to have some type of public meeting next week um, uh -huh. to solicit feedback, but I'll, I want to go through the requirements a little bit more and we can make that okay. decision um, offline. But okay. So I'll just summarize what's here. Um, okay. So for the self-evaluation plan, it's required under Title II of the Americans American with Disabilities Act. If we look at page 21, this is really the, the findings and recommendations. We look at, we're looking at three, really three things here. And one of them I didn't get to because that's the website. So we'll talk about two tonight. Okay. Um, so we're looking at our policies and practices and programs, services and activities. So the basic premise is that um, everybody needs the opportunity to participate in the town's programs, services, and activities. Um, we also got the website to make sure there's um, our website is accessible to those with disabilities, and we also got our buildings and facilities. That's typically what people think about when they think about ADA compliance. Um, so we used templates that were developed by the New England ADA Center, and it assessed. Um, policies and programs built in our building facilities. So we used those templates. We had a committee um, of myself, Jim Ross, Larry Ashman, Keith Bardwell, and Don Sluder. And we did uh, uh, the checklist for the buildings. Uh, so we did those, um, those evaluations. There were two other surveys that went out. One is the sort of a general non-discrimination survey and effective communication survey. And those were sent out, Amy sent those out to all of our boards and committees, chairpersons and um, town departments. We asked them to complete the, uh, complete the survey to the best, best of their ability. And the surveys there, and you're asking in those surveys for the people to make an assessment of facilities they use? Uh, make an assessment of how their board operates um, oh, okay so okay, oh, okay. I so really it comes up it, in most cases it would be if someone came to the meeting and they needed an accommodation would they would would that board of committee know what to do okay. and, and would they know what not to ask and what to ask and if somebody needed an accommodation how would we do it and quite honestly I didn't know a lot of these either um, no. Uh, looking up to anybody in the bus, but um, so it was. Uh, I almost think the process is more valuable than sort of what the findings are, okay. um, and sort of where we go from here. Um, it, it just quickly, we'll just run down through these key findings here about the about the, uh, the general non-discrimination and effective communication. Is that most of the people who responded? So we sent it out to. 24, uh, 24 different boards and committees. We got 11 responses. Um, so a 
a lot of the boards and committees that don't meet often, are the ones we didn't get responses from, but town departments responded and a lot of the boards that meet on a regular basis responded. Um, so most people, uh, most people are aware that the ADA applies and that everybody generally knows what to do. Um, but in terms of really make, making those accommodations or obtaining those auxiliary aids, we could probably, we, we could do better. Um, and I think we should have some sort of policy and some sort of guidebook that would make it easy for our town employees and boards and committees to, um, to be able to access that information and provide it when it's required. Um, the finding two, it talks about communication with, with, co with um, contractors. So anybody that provides services on behalf of the town must do so in compliance with ADA obligations. And um, we don't, the town doesn't have a, a, a policy or a regular practice in our, or language in our documents that remind them of that. Uh -huh. um, we, don't, we don't require assurances and we don't really follow up. Okay. Um, so those are things that can be approved on. Um, So that's really all in terms of the programs and practices. So in looking at our facilities, um, and this is finding one on 22, yeah. the town-owned buildings where, where the town provides most of its administrative services and holds its meetings, which is the town offices and the town hall. As we can guess, those are very accessible, um, almost 100% compliant with the ADA requirements, uh, but there are some modifications that, that uh -huh. would need to be made. Um, uh, here or town uh, hall? Here, okay. uh, the ones at the town hall are, are very minor, uh -huh. and um, oh, those okay. are included in the transition plan. So there's oh, okay. two parts, there's a self-evaluation, and then there's the transition plan, which, okay. here it is, which is Appendix A. I'll, okay. I'll go through a representative one of that. Okay, so, what's, um, what's here? Like in this building, what's not? Um, the uh, service window for the town clerk treasure collector is too high. Uh -huh. Service window on the counter is too high. Okay. Um, okay. Most everything else, uh, we don't have van accessible signage out in a parking lot. Uh -huh. the, the, the stripings and measurements are right, except it doesn't say van accessible on it. A lot of what's in the transition plan, and I know I'm jumping ahead, has to do with signage. That's um, uh -huh. uh, a lot of has to do with signage. Okay. Um, so these buildings are, are in really good shape, which is nice to see. Um, our two public safety buildings, the highway garage and the uh, water department pump house, while they're not open to the public, except for small locations within those buildings, so the police station lobby is a public <coughs> space. Really, the highway superintendent's office is a public space because people would go there to get permits. They're not fully ADA compliant, but they're single level buildings. Um, so we're not looking at the expense of a lift to try to make that building accessible. Um, so there's things that could be done to the, to the approach to the building and to the entrance. Um, for um, not much cost, there would be some cost involved, but that could make those buildings more compliant. Um, town library. Um, we obviously know what the big issue with that is, is that the, the yeah. you can get in on the first, on the top floor, but you can't get down to the bottom floor. And it's a, it's a problem that the toilet rooms are on the bottom floor. So if someone's using the library can't avail themselves of the, yeah. of the toilet room. Um, the elementary school was, was an interesting case. Um, ADA requirements went into effect um, in 1992. The elementary school was built in 1990. Yeah. So it wasn't built to um, ADA specifications, it was built to the accessibility requirements that were in, in place at that time. So most of it was pretty, uh, it was pretty close. Um, there were some modifications that they need to make to the, um, the, the handicap accessible restrooms that are, that are marked as such. Um, which are contained in the, in the yeah. transition plan. But overall, it's, it's in pretty good shape. Um, the playground is, a, is the exact opposite, really, mm -hmm. um, at the school. Um, what we look for is that there's, that there's <coughs> an accessible approach from the building. So an accessible approach needs to have a, a firm, stable surface. It 
can't have too steep of a slope, it can't have too steep of a cross slope. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be an accessible route from the building to the playground. Mm -hmm. And when you get on the playground, which is mulch, and a lot of playgrounds are mulch, there's not, yeah. in, there's not a path, a firm and stable path that you could get to the different, what are called, play components. Yeah. Um, and there's also really not any play components that are accessible. Yeah. So, uh, aside from the library, that obviously needs a lot of work to bring it up to compliance, I would say that the, the playground was another thing that second most out of compliance, yeah. um, if there's such a thing, but. Um, okay. Then we, so we looked at Hurley Heat Park. Um, the biggest thing at Hurley Heat Park is um, an accessible road to the, uh, to the amenities, to the fields, um, to the concessions, to the toilet rooms. Um, there's really not an inaccessible path, and there's, there's no accessible parking that's, that's striped or signed. Um, there's not an accessible path from sort of the entrance onto the field to um, concessions and the toilet room there. There is a step up onto the, onto the cement slab there, but if you were to, if you were to um, install some type of accessible path. If it was hard packed gravel or something, you could just keep it at that same level so it wouldn't require a ramp or anything. But um, And the, the toilet rooms there are not um, ADA compliant. Um, the larger one that's there now, it could probably, would, could probably be, it would probably be least expensive to renovate that one. Put on the grab bars, um, <coughs> the, the dimensions seem to be okay. Um, you got to, you know, put it in a um, sink, yeah. um, soap dispensers, paper towel dispensers, all those types of things. Um, and all of those details are contained in the transition plan, which is Appendix A to the report, to the self-evaluation. Um, and lastly, the center school is the last one. Um, and that, that's the town's least accessible building. Um, but we didn't go into too much detail about um, uh, sort of what exactly would need to be done there because um, that would really take a, 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 a full renovation to, to make that building compliant. So that's the self-evaluation. So I'll just do a representative uh, the transition plan. We'll look at uh, let's look at the fire station, okay. the fourth or fifth one. In. Um, so the transition plan identifies the location, the issue, the recommendation for the modification that would be made to the building, priority, time frame, cost, and whether there's a program alternative. So under the ADA, if you have uh, if you have an inaccessible building, you don't have to. It doesn't require you to upgrade that building. You don't have to make it compliant. But the program services and activities that you provide mm -hmm. need to be provided in a compliant building. Okay. So, for instance, the library. So. The, the library has educational talks that they do in the lower room. Yeah. Well, what should happen is, without that building being renovated, those talks should be held in, in the town hall, for example. Okay. So that people with disabilities can avail themselves of that program. Okay. So that's what the program alternative is. Okay. And a lot of times, that, as well, long as that's being offered, then, it, then the town would technically be in. Um, so, for instance, the fire station here, uh, location, approach, parking lot. The issue: there's no accessible spaces. There's there's a driveway. It's a paved asphalt surface, but there's no signage. There's no accessible. There's no striped accessible um, spaces. Um, so you have to paint the lines. Um, so it's a parking lot, no accessible signage. You'd have to install compliant signs. Um, so the side entrance to the fire station, there's two side entrances. There only needs to be one accessible entrance. Um, they evaluated both of them. 
so there's a little sidewalk that, that goes up to the little concrete pad in front, but that concrete pad is, has too much of a slope. Of course, if someone was trying to operate the door in yeah. a chair, and they would pull it, they would roll. They would roll backwards. Um, so the issue is that the area immediately in front of the side door is too steep. The fix is that you install a level concrete pad in the front of the side entrance, and that, that would be a step towards making that entrance accessible. The other common, the other common thing that we that we saw was um, door handles. Door handles that require um, twisting mm -hmm. are difficult for people with um, with disabilities yeah. um, who have disabilities with their arms. Um, the ones that have pulls, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the, the the C that you see coming out of doors yeah. where where people can pull yeah. is what is what the, yeah. it is what is compliant for ADA standards. Um, in a lot of our, a lot of our buildings, the fire stations representative of, of the highway garage, the police department, and the fire station. These older bathrooms um, mm -hmm. that that were installed in buildings prior to um, yeah. 1992, and which haven't been updated. So, excluding the police station, the police station had a mm -hmm. uh, nearly ADA compliant bathroom, um, but those would require. Um, sort of a full gut renovation yeah. of the bathroom to make it accessible. Um, so that's what the, the self-evaluation contains and what the transition plans contain. It's one for each of the facilities. Um, it took a lot of time yeah, from, from the committee to go through these checklists there. Uh, there's a lot to look at. Um, I thank you because that, this clearly is a lot of time and effort put together and that there's only one section where you're still looking to write it I think is extremely good work. So what's the next steps? So um, the next steps for this is I need to we need to figure out um, how our about how our website should be evaluated. Um, the thought there was a our our web Provider website provider had this thing where you could click on scan your website and I clicked it and then it said your account manager will contact you with results to maybe sell you more stuff. Uh -huh. But um, I looked at some of the other assessments that were done by either consultants or by FERCOG and everybody sort of takes a different approach to how they assess uh -huh. their websites for accessibility. Uh -huh. There's not there's not an ADA standard per uh -huh. se for um, website accessibility. Um, but I want to double check that. Um, other than that, I think it would be good um, if I had a public meeting once this document is, um, once I finish up that section and just mm -hmm. solicit comments on the document. Um, you said the deadline was October 10th or 5th? The grant application is due the 8th. The 8th. Um, so I, I would be looking at maybe holding a meeting sometime in the middle of next week. Um, okay. In parallel to wrapping this up, I need to start writing the um, and working with the library trustees to get that final grant application written. Okay. Do you need us to yeah. redline this online or anything or no? Um, I would appreciate any feedback. Okay. That you guys are willing to so give. So we have some homework to read and comment on this then. Yep. Okay. I'm also I'm also going to send it out to uh, the other members of the committee um, okay. for them to look at it because I was. Not all of us did each of the facility evaluations, so I was writing based off of notes, um, yeah. which leaves room for error. Okay. Uh, Brian, I believe, having taken a cursory glance at what you sent out, that cursory glance was on a PDF. Yep. I can you send, send the Word document. Yep. There, Mike. Yep. Easier this is in Word, and the other one's in Excel. Yeah, just, just in terms of red line. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, in parallel with in parallel with finish wrapping this up, we would need um, to finish up that grant application. And I would really want to submit it. I think the eighth is a Tuesday. I would yeah. I wouldn't want to submit it any later than the seventh, that Monday, okay. if I need the weekend to work. Would that require signatures from us or um, I'll have or to double check. Um, it may. Um, so I just want to leave open the opportunity if you're willing, if we need no. a select meeting at the end of the week. 
So what, what would that application, what's it, what are we looking for, money to? Yeah, for the library, yeah. The, li the library trustees, uh, if you remember, the town appropriated 35,000 at the last annual town meeting for Jones Wood said to do this at the time. Right. For the, the limited use, limited activity platform lift. Right. That's being proposed in that uh, what, what used to be the utility closet. Right. Um, and then it, it would be money for that in the modifications that need to happen for that uh, platform shaft there and then renovations of the of the bathrooms. The existing bathrooms would be changed from multi-users to single users so that they would have the available dimensions. Um, so to comply for that grant, you would need this to be final? Yes. Is that what you're saying? One of the prerequisites to the grant application yeah. is that you have a updated self-evaluation and transition plan. <clears throat> and is that the only grant or the only project we're looking for right now, or is there other improvements? How do these other improvements fit in, or when do they occur? Or? Uh, these other improvements? Yeah. Um, I think that's something that the Capital Improvement Planning Committee needs to start looking at. Okay. Um, but so it should be done in conjunction with the, the different organizations within town that are responsible for, yeah. like John Hannum at the, at the fire right. station, yep. rec, whatever. Yep. 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 It's some, I mean, some of these pro some of these actions are are the one at the town hall. But Neil's off. I should just talk about it. One of the town hall, the, the the door closes too quickly, so you adjust the thing. Or some of these, uh, the accessible parking signs are, are not the right height. Or some of these, we need uh, directory signs at inaccessible exterior entrances, and you need an accessible sign at accessible entrances. So 75% uh -huh. of what's in here is just really low cost, low easy, cost, easy low to do. Low hanging fruit. Um, we you know, love the low hanging so fruit. So when, when we, when we uh, when we pave the the driveways at the police department and the highway department, um, the police department was, was a couple of years ago. You know, we, we probably could have striped it with the with the spaces and everything. We just yeah. haven't done that. Uh, so, but the bigger the bigger more expensive projects, the yeah. um, library, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the playground, yeah. um, really, if we're gonna try to make accessible pathways to different locations. Um, but, okay. And then the, depending on what happens with the center school, that's that's our least right. compliant building, right. um, and the cost associated with that, so. But it's sort of in a di different decision-making category right now, or, yeah. Right, the assumption for all these other buildings is that we're gonna continue to use them for town purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. should REC be involved with CPA for the school playground at any point? Or do we wait? I think so. <coughs> um, I, th I think I think I'd first want to have a conversation with yeah. with Chrissy. Chrissy was there when we did the evaluation, so she was aware of that. Right. Yeah, when they built the playground, it was not a REC department was not involved. No. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think they're pretty they're pretty separate. Um, but they would certainly be. Should the CPC be involved with that? It, oh, is it, a, is it an eligible it project? I, yeah. You have to, you have to work. But the one that's this sort of the, the reason for doing this was the library really wanted to get moving on that. So that's the one project that made us do this. Right. Doing this makes it possible for these other groups to say, hey, if we want to tackle this problem, we have a way to look for grants. But Dan, I think to your point about about keeps us out early CPC money, I think would be eligible to to accommodate that. That's that's my gut instinct. Because I know these grants are far and few between, if, if I understand. Right. It comes out this municipal ADA improvement grant comes out on an annual basis, but there's not a ton of funds available. Um, it's a very competitive grant. I think for a while municipalities kind of lost focus on on this kind of stuff, this energy efficiency and other things yeah. came up. Um, but it, I think the administration trying to bring it back a little bit. Yeah. Um, it, you know, part of the comments that I heard from the you know, the group that we were doing this with is, you know, even if nothing happens, it was good to go through the process uh -huh. and realize and 
you don't you don't see these barriers right during our normal day life especially in places we work right um, you don't see these barriers as I think I probably know the answer to this, but are parking lots eligible for Chapter 90 use? I'm guessing no, but it's a question worth asking. We asked this question about the town hall, so I'll have to check my email because I forget. Remember, we were looking for extra money for the. Again, I'm thinking Harley. It's a parking lot. Yeah. My guess is no. When, when Keith and I had just done the evaluation, we met you at, for the softball project there. We had talked about when it's time to repave the, 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 end, the driveway that goes down the hill, you would extend it a little more and maybe make <coughs> other spaces. How many of you are required um, facing the, um, uh, facing okay. into the field, the concessions? So the taking out some grass. Uh, but, but staying on the parking lot side of the fence there. Right, of course, yeah, so there's grass yeah. leading to all those fences. It's all grass. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people just park on. And then from there you could have a, or even where the fence opens up right next to the, uh, right next to the, the concession stand toilet right. area there. And that right. way you have Just a short path. To. You can make a short path from that entrance, yeah. the fence yeah. entrance, to the. That would be all CPC yeah. right. or Chapter yeah. 90. Would. Right. But, I mean that's the most critical I think for Hurley is that, is that you have that parking and that approach to the concessions, and and the bath and the bathrooms. Yeah. You know, that is the highest priority on that. Sometimes is is the grass an accessible pathway? I would not so. really. No. Um, if I were if I were disabled, I, I would be mad if I had to go across grass. Right. Especially if I'm a frail elder, you know, frail saint, you know, there's no way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's where we are. What else? Okay. So now okay. we're on to thank you, uh, town administrator updates. Yeah. Um, bicycle race, Amy, was that Sunday? Yes. Uh, not the race. Bike for food. Uh, bike, biking event is coming through on Sunday. Um, they have their annual water stop and um, porta potty that they set up here. Um, Hurley Heap Park Field, speaking of Hurley Heap Park, that's coming along. Um, that's all the grading's done, infield dirt's in, right? Fence posts are in, water's in, the piping is in, grass planted this week. Yeah, they should be by the end this week. Yeah, um, that'll be the last piece. They're not going to do the fence part of the, the posts are in, but they'll do the fence after the grass takes yeah. deep in the fall because it doesn't matter what the weather is. Can you move the backstop? Yeah, it's all gone. Yeah. Move the backstop. We, we used what we could. We didn't use all school. Yeah. Height. Height was an issue. It's too high. Um, what the good news or the bad? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, more updates? Yeah, so I got a call on Friday from uh, Army Corps of Engineers and about the Mill River Bank Stabilization Project, the project that, that refuses to go away. Oh, that's not um, that yet? You mean from 10 years ago? Not that, that long ago. That construction ended just before I started yeah. here about yeah. Yeah, three years ago. Um, so the, the Army Corps permit is still not closed, and uh, they wanted to do a site visit. And they wanted to tell me that the permit that was pulled was, uh, the rationale for the permit was an ecological restoration project. So the town needs to prove that, or not prove, but the town needs to show, or the Army Corps is interested in learning what, um, sort of what plants and stuff have returned to the area. So they've asked us to do a wetland delineation of two representative spots in the in the uh, the new ch the channel that carved too close to the wells was supposed to be restored and part of that was supposed to be restored as a wetland. So now they want to come and have us do a wetland delineation and then there's going to be another site visit. How much does a wetlands delineation Good study question. cost? I assume it's a study. Yep. Right. Okay. It's, 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 yeah, it's field work. Um, so the cost is around, the, the quote that I have from the engineer who, who's been involved in the project this far is a little over $11,000. And there's monitoring that needs to take place. I reached out to uh, 
Scott Jackson and, and Petty Divine to get a sense whether that was a reasonable cost or not. Um, uh, and Patty was going to try to talk with uh, Paul Sneringer, who was the Army Corps person that um, is working on the project to see if we can't reduce the scope of what's going to be required so that the engineer can charge us less. Um, so the good news is, what's the bad news? The good news is that um, our, our, the MEMA account that we, the MEMA grant that we had was a reimbursement account. And so a little while back we had about $160,000 sitting in that grant reimbursement account that was going to go back to the town. Um, to the town? To the, sort of to the general fund okay. um, to reimburse because it was a spend first right. and get money back. Right. Um, so we transferred money out of that account I think it was two town meetings ago. Um, luckily, on the on the suspicion that this project wasn't done, um, we kept twenty seven thousand dollars in that account. Um, so we have okay. funds to pay for it without having to go to a special town meeting. But it oh. was kind of out of the blue on a Friday morning that um, this came up. So that is there a timeline? Uh, yeah, that's even the more fun part. They want to have a, the site visit in the middle of October. Does that give Patty enough time to do what she does? Yeah, she. I think she was actually going to talk to Paul today. Um, her colleague, I sound like they were, she was out at that office anyway. So, um, but it doesn't give the engineer a lot of time to do the wetland delineations. Scott Jackson can't do that? He didn't offer it. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't hear back from him on the email. You're like Associate Professor of Wetland Delineation or something? Yeah, I think that's his title. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. So for, well, for the well, town of Whaley? <laughs> no, no. You were in Massachusetts. What would happen if none of this got done? Then we decided, well, we'll just wait till next year. Do it. We'd have to spend money to make it sure it got done. If we told Army Corps to, well, the, the permit's not closed out yet. Yeah. So we didn't fulfill all the conditions of the permit. So, I mean, if we push it to the to the max, I'm sure they could fine us. Okay. And they'd still make us do it. And they'd still make us do it after they take the money. Right. Okay. So, what's are we monitoring the turtles and the, I thought of the plant as well. Right? Yeah, it was some flower. Yeah, okay. as part of the natural heritage endangered species component to the project, which is not Army Corps. Army Corps, the people on there, like dredge and fill. Like if you're filling in a wetland or dredging a uh, navigable waterway, then you're with Army Corps, but um, the natural heritage and endangered species um, is with the state. Yep, and there's endangered species there. Turtles and mollusks. That we're not supposed to talk about. No. Just kidding, they're public, it's public. Turtles and mussels, yeah, right. and 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 flowers. So if you want to have a clam bake, that was the comment. That five grand for two mussels would have been hell of a clam bake. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you probably go hungry because yeah, they're small and there's not that many of them. <laughs> so we, I, I guess the thing I worry about is you do the study. Is the permit closing out? contingent on the results of the study? Like if we somehow fail to restore it to the degree that um, us, they would like, is there? There's there's the possibility that they would ask us to do additional mitigation. Okay. Um, so 11,000 for 27,000. Gosh, I hope mitigation costs less than 16,000. See, my concern, and I think it parallels what Joyce is talking about. Yeah. You can take all the mitigation steps you want, or you're asked to take. Yep. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Right. And it, at what point are we held harmless for, hey, we did exactly what you asked us to do. And it turns out that the, 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 the plant life, the whatever it's called, doesn't want to be here anymore. 
And that may be a factor of something completely unrelated to the work that was done. Maybe it's climate change, who, who knows? Yeah. So at what point are we held harmless, if ever? I don't think that there's a clear answer to that, but I think, I think that's a consideration. Um, in the conversation that I had with Paul on Friday, um, they did, he wasn't taking a hard line tone about it. It, it was more of they want to know what's there. Um, they got to check the box. Um, it, okay. it could be. He wanted to know if, if well, did the wetlands restore or didn't they restore? Um, are there those types of species and soils that indicate that it's a wetland? Um, okay. Right. So I guess we uh, we do it. <laughs> it's not like we have to vote on it, right? Yeah, it's not like we really have a choice. We don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. right. It was kind of like, hey, you need to spend this money and we need a meeting in three weeks. Okay. Get somebody to do it. Okay. Um, All right. Well. I hope you were saving the best for last. Oh, oh the good stuff. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> Am I forgetting anything, Amy? It's been a long day. Say no, Amy. No, it's not forgetting anything. Okay, any items not anticipated within 48 hours of the meeting? Nope. Say no, Amy. Okay, I would entertain a motion. Adjourn. Second. And we're done.